Hey guys, on this uh, episode, we normally record uh, every other week for our patrons um, at Patreon, but we decided to release this one so you can see what you're missing out on. <laughs> <laughs> A little sample platter. Yeah. So sit back and enjoy this bonus episode, normally for patrons only, but for you guys today. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are semi-pro illustrators. We've all worked for a few of the major publishers. Together, we've published some fairly decent books, and we've all phoned it in at university art programs. <laughs> <laughs> semi-pro? <laughs> Oh, each See how offended me and, me and week, Everybody has already heard the intro so many times. Each you week, gotta do something. We fight about questions sent in by our trusty listeners, uh, just like you. And sometimes we do interviews as well. Um, sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each week you're gonna learn something brand spanking new. That's right. And actually, uh a few episodes ago, we talked about um what should we should we call them trusty listeners? Or something else. I don't know if you remember that discussion, Rat but the rabbits. people people gave us some feedback in the comments on YouTube, and I got an email or two. I didn't write them all down. I should have kept track of them, but they were like, "What about um, uh, loyal?" Or what about uh, instead of, instead of trusty? What about interested Honorable. or something like that? Wait, when, when are we calling our audience anything? Like, you just said our coming? trusty listeners. Oh, I, uh, I call him trusty. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know what I'm. I don't know what I say. Don't I don't have. I don't have a script. Here. This is this is off the cuff. Yeah. Whatever I just said, I can't even remember. It's just spewing. <laughs> okay, Lee, tell me, tell us about this job offer you got. Okay, so this is a this is a interesting little story. So I get this this inquiry through my email. Somebody's gone to my website and found my work, and she's an art director. And works for a company in Los Angeles, and they do big, um, like big, huge murals, like wrap around around some of the buildings, or you know, full side of a of a giant building, you know, six story building or whatever. Like driving in L.A., you know, I'm sure you've seen them driving around, but they're beautiful in 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 the city, and and I, I really do love the way it makes uh, different cities feel when you're seeing some of that. It's that illustration. I've seen James Jean do it, and as a matter of fact, one of the architects that I worked with in Portland um, had hired James Jean to do one of the buildings. And so I know sort of the range of the budgets for stuff like that. And so for that one, it started around $250,000 for, uh, you know, the outside of a building. Um, so I so, was so jazzed. Wait, so, so wait, so then Lee contacts us and he's like, guys, guys, I'm up for 250 grand on this project. And no, I, I no, no, admit, no, no. I was getting a little jealous. <laughs> no, no, no. Read it again. I said, these, I know what these <laughs> projects typically pay, mm -hmm. but doing the just 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 getting the contact going i said i'm just chatting with him right now well you remember um, so we like we interviewed um that brazilian girl uh um like last like a, six months ago and she did mm -hmm. she was telling us about this mural that she did she got paid 10 grand for right yeah it's and, it's, it's i mean it go it, it's a good pro i mean i've done a mural an interior mural for a, the architect company that i'm just talking about and they yeah it's around that amount for an you know smaller mural. And so not just dollar signs, but it, I love doing work like that. I like I, like I said, I think it enhances a city when people see illustration in their everyday lives like that. And so I was jazzed about doing it, not not to mention maybe a big payday too. Um so I reply back saying, yeah, I'm into it. Let's uh let's talk about it. And she said, well at first we want to talk about a smaller gig for to get going and that would be like the interior you know that like you got to go through two sets of doors typically in a grocery mm -hmm. store or target or whatever uh, it will go there and it was uh some kind of artwork for the either the wall there or giant printout or something i'm not totally sure of how it's going to be displayed but but right when you come in like a target or walmart or something like that um and then, uh, you know, so I read that and I was like, oh, that sounds, that sounds amazing. That's easy to do. Uh, I'd rather start with a smaller scale too, just to get comfortable working at scale again. And, and then she came back with the, with the offer and it was $600. $600. I couldn't believe it. I was, I just kept, I kept hitting refresh thinking that a zero would keep getting added every time I hit right, refresh. Right. <laughs> so so the, what did you do? That's such so, a low ball. Yeah. After laughing for a little while, 
and sending texts to all my friends and making fun of it, of course, because <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're going to get if you lowball an illustrator. Right. You're going to get made fun of. Um, I wrote her back, educated, because I, I, of course, I'm not going to take the job. But at that point, then I have nothing to lose. And I always think that this is my opportunity to educate somebody because I hope somebody wouldn't do that intentionally. Maybe she's not aware of how pricing works and how and the normal job range. So I start telling her about the Graphic Arts Guild and, and you can get sort of pricing guidelines there to start out your budget. Mm -hmm. um, and I told her that, you know, that she's basically offered less than minimum wage because once you factor in, you, you can't, a lot of illustrators just think of their time as being the paint time. Like how long does it take me to do a painting? But there's the back and forth with the client originally. There's the rough sketches just to get your, you know, the research phase. And then there's the thumbnail sketches that apply to the project. Then there's the tighter sketches that you give them options. Then they pick those. <clears throat> and then you go to revisions, sketches, value study, color study, final paint easily 40 hours to do a job like that easily with all the sign-offs they have to have. Mm -hmm. And that's if you're a fast painter. Um, and so you divide that, you know, 40 hours into, into 40, $600 by 40 hours. It's $15 an hour at best. Mm -hmm. Um, so I said, no. And then, and, and there's just no possible way that I would take a job like that. You know? And, right? I, th and I think that's really good because you didn't say I'm too busy and, and which would be a lie. Um, you mm -hmm. told her the truth. They're like, you're not paying me enough money, which is harder to do. And I'm telling you guys that are listening, like if you're ever offered a job and the money and the reason you're turning down is the money, don't chicken out and say, I'm just too busy. Put mm -hmm. upward pressure on prices by, by saying that's just not enough money. And I would even say this, even if you are too busy, charge three, five, 10 times more than you normally would. Uh, you might get it. There's this, um, there's this idea out there that you shouldn't gouge people or, or charge people too much. And that, that it, I could see that being true in some industries, like, you mm -hmm. know, like let's say um, in contracting or let's say framing a house, you know, if the going rate is, I have no idea what it costs to frame a house, but, but, uh, but let's say in that industry, if you're charging three times as much, no, you're never going to get, you're almost never going to get hired. The only mm -hmm. people that get hired in the trades are the people that are artisans that are doing like custom woodwork that can charge mm -hmm. a lot more money. We are in the custom art business. So right. everyone is different and you, you, you should never think that you can't charge too much. Your time is worth what you say it's worth, not what someone else says it's worth. So, so yeah. Uh, that's my my little soapbox there that I jumped up on. Yeah, you got to be willing to say no. And then uh, I love the idea of educating them. And I also said that's the lowest offer I've ever been given, even as a starting illustrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that as an insult, but it's true. I've never been offered something, even for a spot illustration, offered that low. So, I mean, she's got to know the, where the scale is. And then, of course, you know, instead of coming back saying, and then, and then, oh, the, to end it up, I said, I'll start the discussion for that space and that size at $6,000. And, but if you want to license an image, I'll start that discussion at $3,000. And then yeah, she can take an, an already existing image and use it. And of course, the answer is no from her, yeah. but they don't have enough money in the budget. Thanks for my time. And she's gone. But, you know, who knows it down the road that maybe it made an impact. But if every illustrator, you can't use collective bargaining, so I don't think we need to have set rates, but you do got to think about how, where a piece is going, who the client is, and then also how much time you're investing. So those three That's metrics right. sort of set your time. The and other thing, right. had you said yes, and you're like, oh, God, I really need the money. You know, I'll, I'll just do this 15 hours, $15 an hour is better than nothing. Uh, that I guarantee that client is going to noodle and nitpick and hold your hand you're every work. step of the way. You're going to have zero creative freedom. And and they're going to end sure. up with a with a bad product product too. So right. do you want that? You know. So yep. anyway, fun times being an illustrator. All right, should we get down to the the nuts and bolts here of of today's episode? This is a uh, patron exclusive episode. So if you're hearing this, 
somehow you got you're either one of our patrons or somehow you got an illegal uh Bootleg. pirated copy of this episode or we released more power to you <laughs> yeah or we shut down the patreon and, and released it to everyone who knows who knows how you've heard this but first one from monkey mintaka who if that name sounds familiar to you too uh was in our children's book pro um cohort this last mm-hmm. this last time she says hello it took the last session of cbp and in all the weeks i didn't think of this question monkey covering eyes emoji i don't think it came up for a book dummy, is this normally used just for when you're doing the original story and hoping to get your own book published? Or would it be good to include it in a portfolio if you're just looking for illustration jobs to show that you could think through the whole process? Thank you. So do you, I, I do remember me and Will talking about that one. Do you put a book dummy in your portfolio? And our answer, if I recall, was no, that's not a portfolio piece. It's only used, uh, I think, by request, essentially. And and certain instances are when you're pitching a book so, so that, um, you know, it, it's almost like you wouldn't put a manuscript in your portfolio. Um, now, uh, I, a, a book I want to push back just similar. a little bit on that because mm-hmm. there's, there's there'd be exceptions. I think you're generally, I, I generally agree, mm-hmm. but... Um, I think it's really important to show sequential art in a portfolio to show mm-hmm. that you can handle uh character consistency. And so, right. It, it, and other people, you know, like you, one person's book dummy, like when I do a book dummy, it's really loose and it's just to, to convey the idea. I would never show that in a portfolio, but right. I've seen some beautiful ones out there. So, and I, I don't know if you need to put the whole thing, but you could put part of a, of a mm-hmm. um, book dummy in, in a sketch section on your site. So like, like a lot of critiques that I give people in their portfolio is you're not showing any sequential art. So there's mm. that, you know, so it's important to do that. But yeah. anyway, yeah, I, I don't make book dummies. Um, What for the books I, that I'm working on, I just start working on them. You, you got a good point though. Like if you have a really, I don't think you should have one of these, but if you have a really good looking book dummy, <laughs> All my book dummies are just garbage. Uh, you know, mm. I don't want to show them to anybody except a professional editor, you know, or art director who can like see through, you know, can see, can envision the final thing. Um, um, so, yeah, but if you have something that's a little more polished, a little more good looking that, that you know can get you work, yeah, put it in there. But as a rule, I, I your portfolio should be some pretty finished, polished stuff. Mm-hmm. Did you have any thought on that, Lee? Yeah, I don't think I don't think you should need to add the book dummy in there. If that's your best work, I would say your port that means your portfolio isn't ready to submit yet. And I would suggest like making some new pieces just for portfolio. Just build your portfolio. And because when you submit the dummy to a, a publisher, art director, whoever, they're gonna go right back to your website. And if it doesn't mm-hmm. support what they're, they're going to go, is this what I'm going to get with this art? You know, this final art. And so it all needs to sort of match up. And so I view the dummies as sort of <clears throat> a marathon, I guess, and, and, and not something that needs to be a quick hit on Instagram or on the website. Maybe you show the stuff later. Like once the book comes out, put it all on the website. Why not? I mean, why wouldn't you? Cause it's advertising mm-hmm. at that point, but no needs it. No need to put the book up there early and you should have enough stuff already there to support your work. Yeah. All right. Next question coming in from Tina. Hey guys, my name's Tina. Y'all are awesome. And I'm so glad to be a patron. My question is in regards to having a strong and well-rounded portfolio, I am looking to get picked up by an agency and have been studying uh, the artists on said agencies to make sure I know what's expected at that level. My portfolio shows that I have consistent style, a trained skill set. I can draw a variety of things, adults, children, animals, environments, but I can't help but feel it's missing a vital component. You guys want to pull this up on while I'm reading this. I've got it. it. If you let me share. Okay. I'll let you give you Sharon's screen, invite her to the meeting. Um, 
What would you recommend is a must have set of components in a portfolio aiming to work in comics, entertainment, and possibly advertisement? So it's beautiful work. Um, Heck yeah. Three totally this. different areas, by the way. I don't, I don't know yeah. if there's an easy way this, to say that. This is actually one of those comments where I would say there's not a lot of sequential art, if any. So mm-hmm. like if you want to do comics, if I want to hire you to do comics, I want to see you carry um some scenes and have you know mm-hmm. everything is is full uh bleed there's no spots so like we have a um if you email me at uh, will at will terry.com i will send you a pdf we have on um the variety that you should show in your portfolio it's mm-hmm. called portfolio perfection and it's basically like all the things you should put in your portfolio yeah Scroll back by up. svslearn.com. Scroll back up, Will. I, I'm looking at, so if, if you're just listening to this, um, she just has this beautifully illustrative, almost like, um, um, like a, it's like an Art Nouveau, but a contemporary, you know, version of it mixed mm-hmm. with sort of pop Gorgeous. culture, um, screen print style i don't know mm-hmm. how how else you would describe it it's really cool well, you kind of could see some of this in, in some of those mondo movie posters um there's a little bit of that going on there um it's all really it's, good. it's mostly um like what i would call gallery you know decorative gallery figurative work and mm-hmm. one-offs and that's great but yeah like if you're looking to get hired as an illustrator you've got to you got to show that you you're going to carry the, the characters into act both action and emotion to hold a story. Um, yeah. Yeah. So specifically like looking at this, I could see you getting book cover assignments. Um, I could see you getting, um, you know, any sort of interior work to, to go along with that as well. Like, you know, if someone wanted to do a really artsy, ver- I could see you doing your own project too, kickstarting something, uh, um, a self-publishing something in this style and it doing really well. It's just a very accessible, beautiful style um, as far as uh, illustration work goes. If you want to get into comics, you have to show comic pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could get work as a comic cover artist doing this kind of stuff. Um, but you have to show that you can, you know, you've got one piece of sort of fan art in there and I, uh, of the Nausicaa Miyazaki film, I would say, you know, round that out with five other ones, uh, you know, do a star Wars one, do it, do hit, hit all the major franchises just so that, um, an art director can really see, Oh, this is cool. How this person would, bring their you know their style to a to a property mm-hmm. um but but Walt, walter agrees i don't know if you can hear him bark in there he wholeheartedly <laughs> agrees with, with that one dogs barking in the background but if you want to get sequential artwork you got to show that you can do pages that you can do sequential art so you know practice doing some short stories you know a five pager a ten pager um entertainment concept artwork um, this is not the style that's that's uh, going to get you that kind of work. You have to, you kind of have to do the style that uh, art directors are used to looking for when they're hiring uh, concept artists. But uh, she's she's got the ability to do whatever she wants, really. So yeah, I think so. Just yeah. need to need to demonstrate it in the portfolio, which takes. Time, I agree. But... I agree with Jake, though. I mean, like the the one area that I would encourage is is the book cover. I mean, it's ripe for the book covers. You don't even have to change anything. Like with all these other mm-hmm. things you're talking about, you have to change something. But you're already doing the book covers. I mean, perfect style. So what I would do is do some mock book covers, put some type mm-hmm. in there, say, hey, I'm trying to get book covers. I mean, that's the way you get work, right? Is you do a bunch of work that looks like a certain thing and you say, hey, I'm trying to get this kind of work. <laughs> yeah. It's really specific. Um, but- and and it's just funny how many people kind of meander and they're like, well, I'm trying to get this, but they don't really show that. Um, you just add type to this and say, I want to do book covers and I guarantee you'll get work. Hmm. 
there's a, the irony is you never get hired to do something you haven't done before. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. You know? So even if you look at like, like big film directors, like nobody hires a film director who hasn't directed a film. So what mm -hmm. do they do? They start by doing indie films, their own, their own films. It starts with a short film and then someone sees they can do that and they'll give them a little bit more money and they'll, they'll do a bigger film. And, uh, and it's the same thing with, with what you're doing here. You have to do, give yourself the assignment. If, if we were to write a book, a three point perspective book, I think the title would be give yourself an assignment, give yourself the assignment, something like mm -hmm. that. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're excited for you though, Tina. Keep, please keep us posted on your career as it goes. Okay. Anne Marie says, hello, I love drawing from a young age, but I do not have a degree in art and only started really working at it seriously about a year and a half ago. Partly inspired by a fabulous, fabulous. I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> Partly inspired by a fabulous Inktober experience. <laughs> I currently work in uh, an unrelated full-time job, but I've been working at improving my art skills, both foundations, level stuff, and some personal illustration projects for fun whenever I'm able to. Before or after work, during breaks, on weekends, it's my dream to become a full-time illustrator. I'm considering trying to do a master's degree in the subject if possible, so I can really devote a couple of years to fully focus on building up my skills. Some of the schools I'm looking at ask for portfolios that reflect real industry assignments. Do you have any advice about how I might go about this? I've never had a real industry assignment. This kind of goes along with what we're just saying. You got to give yourself an assignment. Yeah. I'm wondering what that entails. If it's any different from just picking a scene from a story, for example, and trying to illustrate it, which is what I've been doing on my own so far. Not sure if I'm in over my head here. Perhaps an MFA program assumes you already work professionally. Any advice would be much appreciated. Thanks so much for the wonderful podcast and for the SVS courses and community. Okay, well, I saw you shaking your head. Yeah, so unfortunately, not all master's programs are created the same. Mm -hmm. And most uh, most of the work that I've seen come out of uh, master of fine art programs for illustrators. So illustrators who have gotten a BFA or something like that, or a BA, their work is good. Okay. So they're doing good illustration work. Some of them really good. And they're like, Hey, I think I want to go do a master's degree. Nine out of 10, the work that comes out of that program, I look at and I go, you just wasted your time. It's horrible. Now, there's one program that I that I know of that I like, and I don't know if it's still good because see, things don't stay the same, right? But that's mm -hmm. that one out of Hartford. Um, the one that Murray Tinkleman started, but he's passed on. I don't know if the torch was passed, but it was a children's book. That's if you want to do children's books, you know. Um, yeah. uh, and then the focus was on you're working on, uh, you know, a children's book. So you're you're actually doing the thing that you want to do. And that's extra practice doing the, the thing that you want to do. But like I've seen so many that are like, you know, explore yourself. And so... <laughs> They explore and they find a part of themselves somehow that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I graduated from that program, right? That's right. Because that's right. You went through with um, Brandon Dorman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of our, I mean, David Hone went through it. I okay. mean, it's a, it's a good one because it's, um, yeah. it's the hard Hartford um, remote kind of I MFA. Forgot. So, I forgot you wasted yeah. your time there. Yeah, it was a waste of time. <laughs> was it? Ah, uh, I, I, it's a mixed bag. Yes, it was a waste of time. Ultimately, uh, could I have gotten all that stuff without doing an MFA? Absolutely. My school actually required me to get an MFA, uh, but to teach, I was a full-time teacher mm -hmm. at that point, and in Portland, and I, I was required to get it. And so that was the best one that fit my life, and it was okay. I mean, we 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 learned some stuff. It was, but there was nothing magical. Other than them saying, "Hey, go make something. You can already mm -hmm. do. You can right. already go make something." Now, I on love, your own. the one thing that I got out of it was uh, the the people that I was around. I I made some great friends and still have them as friends. And you know, I love. You paid that, fifty grand. It's too to much have some to friends. pay for friends. I could have sent them some Girl how, Scout cookies, and they would be my friend. I mean, like, how I don't much? Need... How much opportunity costs? Because I looked at it too when I was looking at teaching full time for like two seconds. I looked at it. Mm -hmm. it was my wife really wanted me to do it? I and I'm like 50 grand too. Yeah, $50,000, but I was working 
um, you know, full time as an illustrator. And I'm like, I will have to turn down a lot of work. So what was the opportunity cost on top of the 50 grand? Right. Absolutely. What was it for you? Like, did you ever calculate that? It's yeah, because, years. because I, I used my, I used my time, like I sold everything that I did for that school as an original painting, and I've sold many, many prints of <laughs> <Yeah>. that. So, <laughs> so I forgot was, we're talking to Lee here. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing though: is is <laughs> yes, there's opportunity costs, but there's also there's something to be said about kind of putting your money where your mouth is. You know, anybody could say, "Oh, I'm taking the next two years. And I'm just going to teach myself how to do art," and then it's like hey, we're going out tonight, or hey, you know, we're doing this vacation, or hey, or whatever, you know, life creeps in, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if you're enrolled in a school, and you're paying $50,000 to go to it, it's a good psychological tool to say, uh, no, I have finals this weekend, I have to, um, you yeah, know, it's I have to it's accountability. Stuff. You know, so then put 50 grand in a, in a, in someone else's savings account and tell them, don't give this back to me unless I do all these things. Oh, that's I, good. You know, I like that. I like that. <laughs> that's an option. That's an option. It, it really depends on how uh, your personality, but also like the personalities around you because, um, and, and how you deal with them. Right. Cause some people just can totally respect, Oh, you're in, you're in an MFA program. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, I, I understand what you're, you're doing right on some level and other people might say like, well, why can't you just take some time off uh, and come join us? You're just playing right now if mm -hmm. you're not in an MFA program, but you're in your, you know, this self-prescribed like kind of thing. So, so we're, I mean, we're debating the merits of whether or not you want to do an MFA or whether you should do an MFA. I think the question is, I, it seems like Anne's, Anne Marie's like set on it. Like, this is the thing she's going to go do. Um, what essentially, just to narrow our focus here, what does she need to give them in order to get into it? Um, you know, they're saying, show us some work that you've done that's like a professional assignment. I would I mean, say, let me back up a little bit. I, I, yeah. I can't, I can't go with that line of thinking. It, it's if mm -hmm. your goal is to be a professional illustrator, doing an MFA will not lead you. Down it's a that waste path. of your time. It will. Yeah. It's an, it's indulgent. If you want to do a personal project or you want to feel better and, and credentialed. I mean, we live in an, a, 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 a society that values credentials. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Every other field has them. And mm -hmm. it's a way, there's sort of a lot of imposter syndrome, I think, that goes along with being an artist, especially if you haven't done it your whole life or haven't worked professionally, mm -hmm. that you oh, won't yeah. be legitimate without the degree. Mm -hmm. But let me assure you, that degree means nothing in, in terms of working professionally. And mm -hmm. the work that you focus on in school will not do that either, unless you're super driven, which you could do without the school, if you're already okay. super driven. Here's another thing I would say. In general, if you took the body of working illustrators, mm -hmm. right, um, and then you took all the guys, all the illustrators who got MFAs per capita, your best illustrators are not going to have an MFA. Mm. That's right. And the people Lee, that Lee, went to the MFA, you and Bra you and uh, oh, not it wasn't Brandon. It was um, you went with um, well, David Holland is working. No, but the guy in Utah, our friend in Utah that. Oh, 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 um, uh, uh, Ben Sowards. Ben Sowards, yeah, yeah. So, so Ben is definitely breaking that mold. But I would, I know so many people who are lacking. All it, these people were already professional before they went in, though. Right. <laughs> so that's the one caveat that I didn't. I don't know a single person who wasn't a pro who went to MFA who then emerged a pro after they left MFA. It doesn't make you better. In in many cases, like, and I, I can't say her name because. So, mm -hmm. so, so there's someone who I know who won a bunch of Society of Illustrator Awards. Her work was and is still amazing. But her, when she, I was like, I couldn't wait to see her be, her MFA work. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was choking on words trying to figure out how not to offend her. Mm -hmm. oh, and she's like, this is what I did on my MFA. And I'm what like, what do you think happened there? Well, they make you come up with a thesis. Um, not, and I'm not talking about the one you went through. Um, Lee, but no we had to do that too they, they come up with uh you have to come up with some kind of uh existential crisis idea sort mm -hmm. of uh you know way of seeing the world that no one else has seen it before so you're basically making it up i mean it's just 
it's not it's not real and it's it doesn't indulgent. Have, it's, it's, indulgent. Yeah, it's indulgent and it, and so you explore something and most i think what happened with her is she ended up exploring something she didn't really care about it showed in her work yeah it was worse work she wasn't having fun doing it you could see it in the work mm. i'm like if that's what an mfa is i don't want to have any part of it and then i found about the 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 murray tinkleman uh hartford i tell you can i tell you program. a funny mfa story this girl that I worked with in Portland, she was a, she, I shared a studio with her for a while. She was a book designer, um, book cover designer, and <clears throat> really, really, really good graphic designer. But she went to, she went and got her MFA. And while she was there, she just randomly got interested in furniture making. And so, uh, so she, 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 they had to come up with their thesis, like Will was saying, and she wanted to do, uh, she wanted to build her own chairs and, and so they're all for it, you know, go for it. She's going to build these chairs. She's going to learn to be a furniture maker all of a sudden in two years, even though she's been a graphic designer, she's there to learn to be a better artist in what she's doing. Um, and she, she kind of goes the side road. She makes all this furniture and does fine, whatever. And then she leaves. And now looking back on it 10 years later, she's like, what in the world was I doing? I had all these resources available. She was in New York at the time. And, uh, and she was for, they didn't discourage it or or change her route or anything. They're just like, okay, cool, you're gonna do these chairs. And it's just it's super, not based in the super real indulgent. It's, yeah, you wanna do not, chairs? Okay, go ahead. It's like what do you what do you want? And I, I think a lot of illustrators don't even ask themselves what do they really want? You know, like mm -hmm. like like we we don't get to the to the meat of what do we really want? Like like the thing that I really want is I want to make I want to make children's books. That's really that's really the only thing I care about mm -hmm. doing. I've I've mm -hmm. I've honed it down to that, right? I want to make children's books that are commercially successful because I can't really afford you know I'm not independently wealthy and so I can't afford to not make money. So that's that's really what I want. And I want mm -hmm. people to love what I make to the point where I can make enough money to and and I don't need uh to go exploring something else. I know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I only, if I only do that one thing, I'll be good at it over time, you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. So that, I and, think you're, you know, uh, at the end of the day, like, like it's give yourself an assignment and see it through. Like mm -hmm. I, this summer I made a book, um, the, the, the spaceships book, right? Like this thing right here did not exist prior to um to june and when now I started it exists working on it. and now it exists and it's it's a uh you know it's sort of proof of a thing that I've, i had never seen before which is part comic part art book part incredible cross sections visual dictionary book um all rolled into one right and um and this right here could have been an mfa project easily and I would have had to pay fifty thousand to do it. Instead, I made fifty thousand dollars. Right. You know, making this book. Right. Right. So, That's a good point. Um, so, and and you I know, this isn't my first thing, book. I yeah, same thing with all of our stuff. I mean, we just yeah. make stuff, and this is still my best sell. The the book I made for my Kickstarter is still my best selling product. It's a great book. annually. Um, and like like Jake saying, you made money instead of. I mean, you still have to come up with the thesis which is a project anyway mm -hmm. yeah um i think yeah. that school in general art school for a lot of people is a is an excuse to hang out um <laughs> be, because no really like like in my in my um university classes at uvu every year i could count on three to five students that were serious out mm -hmm. of 20 mm -hmm. okay so three to five students were serious and they were there to work and guess what they would have done well with or without me that's the reality. Mm -hmm. It was a sad reality um, because well, they would I, have. I don't know if that's exclusive I, to art school. I think I, I help. You know. Well, and I, yeah, I I helped them a little bit, but I think it's human but nature. The, the others were there, and I'm like, so you pay all this money, <laughs> so that you're what your parents don't hassle you, so your spouse doesn't hassle you, so that you have like I have to be to school, right. so I have something to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that as that the MFA program is the same thing. It's like, the I don't MFA really know what worse. to do next. So I'm going to pay a bunch of money. And then people can, will all think, wow, I'm in an MFA program. You know, this person, wow, this is, wow, they're serious. They're in an MFA, you know, and so you have an excuse to not be successful. 
Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Yeah. Do you know what's more impressive? Saying, oh, yeah, I uh, made a book and it, it, you know, it supported, it paid my mortgage for the year. Yeah. Right. Or I have a booth that I take around at Comic Cons or art shows and I'm able to, you know, supplement my my income with that just from yep. going out on a few weekends every year right like you learn so much from just doing a booth at comic-con yeah <laughs> there's a there's a flip though because psychological the, like approach to uh, to the art like what sells what people are interested in what, you know what if your work is actually appealing what isn't right there's a flip though because like, like if you say you're in an MFA program, I know we're beating this to death, but it's so fun. If you say you're in, a, in an MFA program, <laughs> <laughs> you get all this accolades like, wow, you right? Okay. If you're Mike Mignola, and I don't know his whole bio, but someone like that who created, mm-hmm. you know, who is self-published, right? He's not self-published, but. Okay. But. Well, take someone who's successful, like, uh, like Scott Inman for the, from the mm-hmm. oatmeal. Okay. If you say to those same people, well, I'm going to self-publish a book, you get like, you know, get away from me and don't, I don't want my kids hanging out with you at all, you know, Mm -hmm. um, at first until your thing blows up and then it's your Mike, you know, your, your Matthew Mm -hmm. Inman or your, Mm -hmm. you know, fill in the blank. I mean, like then all of a sudden you're, you're somebody because of your commercial success. So I don't know. I, I just, yeah. When, when I mean, the MFA is over, you got to look in the mirror and ask yourself what's next anyway. You know, the other thing too is don't discount the quality of life that just having art as a, as a hobby or as like a, uh, an escape, like it can be just that too. You know, mm-hmm. there's some people who ruin art for themselves because they try to make it a career. Right. That's true. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with it being, you know, the equivalent of uh, having a, you know, a weekend band that you, mm-hmm. you go, you get together, pick up an instrument, play around, you know, get right. all the endorphins running. You've made something. And then um, and then you have, you know, a legitimate job that can, can support this. Yeah. This uh, this hobby. As well. it's, it's also getting in the right mindset like this book that I'm working on that's self-published mm-hmm. um, this pickleball book I'm having so much fun doing it that that's the most important thing is I have to make it for me mm-hmm. first mm-hmm. and love doing every part of it I'm not right I'm not making it going I, I hope I make all this money that's the mm-hmm. wrong way to look at it I do hope I make all this money but that's after it's all said and done. That was the same with the spaceships book. Yeah. Like I'm, I was every day I was working on that. I was like, it, it was work. There's not. I mean, you have to like it's not easy. pull yourself. Yeah. To, yeah, you have to get yourself to that drawing table and work on it. But then every time you finish a page or you finish a, a section of it, you're like, oh, this is such a cool thing. You know, mm-hmm. can't believe this. This uh, this, you know, I get to do this. Um. One last component of that, though, the, the I, there is a there is a part of school which is the camaraderie, the the cohort of people that you're with, that you're going through it together. That's something that's really hard to find outside of school. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't mean uh, just because you're not an MFA doesn't mean you shouldn't be taking classes. Mm-hmm. That every okay. every community typically has um, a a lot of classes that are available, even even just on a um, I want to say adjunct. What what is it when you're not in fully enrolled? You're just taking a class. Uh, you're a for that? auditing. Your auditing. Yeah. Auditing. Or what? No, I don't know if it's all, whatever. You just take a class from a college that where they offer just a one one off kind of class. It doesn't go to credits and all that stuff. I mean, even mm. an art center when I was in L.A., they had art center at night, which was almost this. It was the same teachers from the day program. A la carte. Teaching at the night program, a la carte, and it was like the day program. The same co- class cost three thousand dollars. At night, it cost six hundred and fifty dollars. Do you remember same Kazoo, teacher. what he said? Oh no! What did he say? He, uh, all of his friends went to art center. He couldn't afford it, so he just hung out with them and in, in their night That's classes true. or whatever. 
And you just show up. <laughs> he was He's like, there. no, I'm not taking the class. I'm just here to hang out with my friends. And the teacher's like, oh, whatever. But then he'd care. go and he'd learn from them and he'd do assignments. He didn't get a grade or a degree or anything, but he's, he's learning from them. Yeah, he, it's amazing. Get the tools. He, he's, he's amazing. Yeah. But take classes. That's, uh, Jake makes a good point that you, I couldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today without the people that were around me in my undergrad class. But the school wasn't the 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 glue it was just being it was just a reason to be there but it didn't have to be that school um you know just make it get a group of friends i mean go to scbwi critiques or or people from svs i mean it's a great group try to get together with people but take classes and uh, and then all the online resources are available too at this point and so it's just there's just no reason to do that can i I want to add one more final thing because we have totally beat this up, <laughs> but probably a lot of people are thinking about it. Keeping um, these horse it, clipped as the it MFA does, podcast. It does make us mad. And so we go all the way into the, the whole thing because we've all taught, like we say in the beginning, at so many schools and so many years. And I don't know if it's all for the value, if, if, if the juice is worth the squeeze, as I guess, as they say. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you guys know who David Goggins is, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, he's so that he's the, uh, this Navy SEAL. Ex -Navy he's this Navy SEAL, SEAL guy. He's on, Joe, he's on Joe Rogan sometimes. Yeah. Um, I think because I watched like a couple of clips of Joe Rogan on Instagram, all of a sudden David Goggins started showing up in my feed. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. The logarithm has now think that that's what I want. So, but, right. um, but so anyway, so I'm scrolling through some videos or whatever, and and every one of his videos is him him jogging. This guy is a so he's just, he's like the Uber person like he's the guy who will run 100 marathons in 100 days he's that kind of guy or he yeah, he has crazy. like the world record of pull-ups or something but right. anyway and his 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 little posts are 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 kind of funny but there's some truth to him but this one post was him jogging and every one of them is him doing something active he's mm -hmm. jogging he's like you know i always get these emails about people saying like you know i'm having trouble with this or i can't get in shape i can't do this what do i do what do i do and I'm going to, I'm going to have to change his language a little bit because it's, it's, it's a little <laughs> salty, but he's basically, he's like, I figured out what they should do. Here's the answer. Stop being a sissy. You're just a big <laughs> sissy. You don't want to do the work, do the work. And it was so funny. It was so straightforward. Mm -hmm. He's like, if you want to be in shape, get up and go do something and change your diet. Like quit like, Oh, I'm too tired to do this. Or I'm not motivated today. Like it was such simple and profound <laughs> advice mm -hmm. that now I find myself, it was funny because I was laughing at it. Cause he's so aggressive with it. I'm like, dude, settle down, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> relax. But it was true. What he was saying is like, if you want the thing, just go make the thing and mm -hmm. stop needing all the stuff. He, um, he practices what he preaches too. Yeah, yeah. he does. I mean, it. like and, he is his story. I mean, if you, if if I love this guy, but if you if you want to learn what commitment is, and what sacrifice is to get what you want, mm -hmm. look look into David Goggins' story. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's preparing for war. He he's like, oh, you need to wear you need to wear headphones while you're working out. You're a big sissy. What happens if you don't have your headphones? You're not going to work out. He's a little <laughs> he's a little too far on that side. He's the preparing guy for war. The story that I love was that guy that they had, they were running in like minus 20 mm -hmm. in Chicago and mm -hmm. they get back to the apartment and they're freezing and the, and the guy's paying him to mentor him. Right. Oh yeah. And I the guy looks this. over at like Lake Superior or whatever the lake is by Chicago. I don't know. And he's like, you probably want me to go swimming right now. And he's like, we're going swimming right now. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and it made him say that. Think about and they were freezing cold after this long run. And they had to go jump in Lake Superior, oh, and that man. guy died. <laughs> but it was but it was the lesson, though. <laughs> no, but there's truth Goggins to it. Is like, like he just wasn't he, he just wasn't uh, he was a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> he <was a> sissy. <laughs> oh man! He but there's committed. some truth to it. It's like is we stop messing around with all the stuff, all these secondary things. And if you want to make something, go make the thing. You don't need that much. All you need yep. to do is come up with a project and go make the project, and then post the project. And we yep. don't. Mm -hmm. There's not much more than that. That's right. I know. You just don't. Mm -hmm. I get don't the feeling sissy. though. You just you just want someone to like show you here's step one, step two, step three. But it's, I mean, nobody knows the exact steps for everything for for the you know the place you're trying to get to. It's mm -hmm. like you can't ask for directions to uh, uh, you know from someone to a place they've never been. You know, because you have different experiences, different life. You have to do some of your own research. I, I, I totally agree with that. You got to like 
figure out your own plan, figure out your own life and, um, and, and make it happen. Okay. Change shift gears here really quick. Morale says, just wondering if any of you had repetitive strain injuries like carpal tunnel throughout your career. How do you guys fix your carpal tunnel? Show them, show them your devices, you guys. I got one, but it's upstairs. Dang it. How, how do you like it? It works. It works. I've got this tennis elbow, but that's, killer. but that, I don't have tennis elbow from drawing. I have it from yeah. Pickleball. So what Lee's holding now for our listeners is a weird springy contraption. There's like a roller on it. There's a orange ball. Uh, looks like a little tangerine and he's squeezing his arm into it. It hurts so good. And I, and yeah. It feels so good. You put that little ball like right on your muscle and then you just rotate your arm through it. And man, it, you don't even know how good it's going to feel until you put your arm in that thing. And you're just like, Oh, however, so nice. Mm-hmm. However, if you're doing something to get it, you kind of want to also treat the the cause. So treat the cause. Yeah. I I don't know why uh, morale is getting um, this carpal tunnel, but I got it really bad when I was using the um, the Intuos tablet, where you look at you know you look at your screen, mm-hmm. and then you're and then you're drawing down on your lap, you know, or mm-hmm. wherever you have the the, on the, the tablet. Desk. And eventually it got so bad. I was going, I was working on a children's book and I would go from being able to work, you know, eight or 10 hours a day down to six, down to four. And when I finally got to two, I was like, this is not working. Like, and I could not, I'm shaking out my arm and it was killing me to draw, killing me. Mm -hmm. And when I got down to an hour, I was like, I had, I, that's why I have a Cintiq monitor. I just, Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to afford it at the time. And when, that happened i went i was like i've got to change right away and then it was gone because the since. intuos were you just like curling your you arm end up yeah you end up doing this if, if you're watching us on youtube you're you chasing just, this cursor is what happens yeah. you're 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 chasing that cursor and you don't realize it over time so you're flexing muscles in a weird way um that doesn't happen when you draw on paper or on a cintiq but some i have heard some people get it from doing that as well i've never had that problem to mm-hmm. add to that point um there's, I've, I've noticed, especially with people learning to draw and learning to paint, that they grip the whatever painting or drawing tool like it, like it's a grip of death. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. so in my beginning classes, like, you're like a I'll tornado. Win. Yeah. I mean, it's just like holding on for dear life. Um, in my early classes, I would sneak up behind students and smack the pencil or smack the paintbrush. And if it stayed in their hand, they're holding it too tightly. It mm-hmm. should be, I, th- what I like to say is it should be almost like you're lightly holding like an egg or something delicate. So you don't want mm-hmm. it to fall, but you also don't want that. Pr- there's a difference that, you know, I can hold it and, and comfortably relax my hand and still not drop the thing. But the second I pinch any tighter, now there's stress all the way through your arm. Mm-hmm. And you got to find that point, got to release that grip and just, uh, you know, relax your wrist, relax your arm. If you can bit. hold your pinch your uh, drawing instrument, if you can draw this way too, that seems to help some people. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of instead of gripping like you would normally write with a pencil, but you hold right um, or like, hold back on the pencil. You know, tend to tend to relax it, like, it a little bit too, like this and drawing with the tip. You know, yeah. And take all breaks. Right. Um, that's I'll, let me add one more thing to that. I don't know if I have mm-hmm. any of them up here, but all of. Most of our society, I grab this, I'm grabbing a teacup right now or coffee cup. Most of our society, we're gripping things like this using this strength, which is a flexor going in. Mm -hmm. Um, And rarely does it go the other way. So it develops patterns that are only unidirectional. And so I've got this, um, basically, like if you put a rubber band in your fingers, if you can picture that all four wrapped around all four fingers and your thumb and you open it, it... Um, it works the opposite side of that grip, if that makes mm. sense. So we're always flexing this way. So you want to go the other way to have that balance. I have to like do it myself. All right. Um, in 2020, this is Natty Art says, in 2020, I signed on with an agent. It's a literary agency. And my main goal was and is to work on my own titles. We've been working on a couple of dummies, but I also keep getting picture book illustration jobs, which is great, of course, but I feel my own books, my passion really, gets sidetracked and I get to spend little time on them. For 
2023, I would really like to focus on my own books. I'm not even sure if I'd even like to take on more picture books written by authors. The years before signing on with my agent, I have mainly made my income with self-published work, my shop, etc. And I actually miss that time a lot. I can't express how much I enjoy bringing my own characters and stories to life. Do I persevere with the picture books written by other authors or set a course and be clear about my goal? This would mean saying no to a sequel of a title I've worked on, for example. My work can be found here. Thanks so much. Uh, Nattyart.me. I, man, I, I feel like you and me are the same person here because I've had this, this same, I know mm-hmm. all three of us kind of like have had the same type of thing. Um, <laughs> My advice would be do the sequel to that book because it, it's uh, it's so much easier to do the second of a book. You've, you've done all the work figuring really out the characters is. and everything. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be like the easiest money you're going to make this year is the sequel to that book. Um, and I would say set a goal to... Um, to put out you know, to to essentially make your own project whether you self publish it try to get your agent to get a deal and if that falls through then do it your do it yourself but um i i would say if if you're really feeling it if you could afford to do it if you enjoy running your own shop and self publishing and doing a kickstarter that is completely uh satisfying uh to to go that route especially if you can if you can afford to do it if if it can be profitable I would say just just make the leap and and do that. Don't cut ties with your agent though, because you you never know what sort of opportunities might might pop up, or if one of those Kickstarter project or self published things might turn into a a future book deal or something. You know, it might be a proof of concept for something bigger and better. So that's my sort of off offhand advice on that on that one. Yeah, this is this is a weird issue because uh, I ran into it and like like Jake was saying probably will too. It's it's the professional illustration problem. Um, mm-hmm. It's a good one to have. It means you're getting work, uh, but it's that exact issue that she said side. I won't say sidetracked me because that's a that's the wrong word, but it preoccupied me for ten years, where now I'm still trying to do my own book because I had so many books from you know, other authors and stuff like that, that, and picture books are not easy. They're marathons. It's not Mm -hmm. easy to say, Oh, I'll just do a picture book and then I'll do my own book on the side. It takes so much energy. If you're 20, maybe it's going to work and you don't have a family and you've got all this energy, but, uh, it's a lot of work. And so it can bog you down. And you do, like Jake said, if you got the ability to just say, Hey, let's do one picture book a year for an author. And then I'll do my own on the other side. But the, as much as you take is as, as they'll keep giving. And as you do more, they'll keep giving more. All of a sudden the years will start to tick by. So you got to carve out that time. Um, and you, you got to basically say, I'm not going to take work or take a different kind of work. That's not so uh, long-term. And, and I believe that in, in general, ultimately, um, if you're, you know, if you're writing and illustrating your own books or you're capable of doing that, when you take on an illustrating, you know, a project where you're illustrating someone else's, you're just delaying the possible success that you could have, because ultimately you can make the most amount of money as author illustrator. So you know, you're just you're you're basically you're weighing out the sure thing versus the you know the question behind question mark behind door number two. But behind door number two could be could be amazing, um, and so you know, for some people it is can I afford to do it? Cause you know, if you're supporting a family, you've got to take the sure thing. Usually if you can afford yeah. not to, I think you should have, you should, you should try to just work Are on you your own stuff. Checking out her portfolio. It's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. I'm just going to share it really quick. Like, uh, it, this is just right up my alley. I love, I love this stuff. I, I, You've got a great uh, YouTube um, kind of vibe going on here too. If you look at her YouTube channel and like mm-hmm. the aesthetic and everything, I think you've got everything in place that if you want to really invest in yourself, you'll be successful at it. Um, and I, I, again, keep one toe 
in the publishing world because uh, it's handy and helpful to have those connections there. But man, when you can, you know, when you can sell your own prints and um, when you can run a shop and, and sort of get all that, that stuff going, I think you're at a really good spot because you don't, the publishing world is so fickle, Mm -hmm. so fickle. And your fans, the people who are actually genuine fans of you, they're just going to want more of what you do, you know? So you, you keep making stuff for them and you'll be, you'll be doing just fine. Um, and, and that way the publishing world, when it, when you two intersect, you can make, you know, do whatever you need to do there. And then they're going to go their way. You're going to go your way. You still have your fan base. Um, okay. Next, next one. Um, this is from Sarah. I, I feel like I remember you once bringing up registering your business as an LLC in one of the podcasts. Did you? At what point in your career do you do that? Do you also set up separate business bank account? I'm really still trying to get a picture of what it means and looks like to be entrepreneurial. Um, so yeah, I would I would say um, as soon as possible, get a business bank account, set up an LLC, and, and s- start uh, working out of that. It just, it for me personally, that's what I did, and it made um, it made finances a little bit easier to like manage and understand. And essentially, I would just pay myself out of that business account. I never had any check go into a personal account. I was getting paid to this business account, and that way I could keep um, business expenses separate business savings separate and really understand how much money I actually had. Cause sometimes, you know, you get a Kickstarter, $80,000 gets transferred to your account. If that's your personal account, pretty soon you're buying groceries with that money, you know, Oh, the dishwasher broke, you're fixing the dishwasher, you're placing that. And then now it's time to like ship out all your books and you ran out of shipping money, <laughs> you know, like none of it's left. So I would say even as early to train yourself, even if you're just doing a couple thousand a year, run it through your LLC and uh, sign your contracts, make the deals with your LLC, not with you mm-hmm. and, uh, and have that business account because um, a, it protects you, you know, if, uh, if anything ever happens and um, you know, for whatever reason you get sued or you get um, you know, the publisher, something goes backwards with a publisher or something, somebody you're working with um, your LLC is the one that, is this buffer between you and whatever's going on over there. Then nothing, none of your personal assets or, or, you know, your home or, or anything like that accounts are going to be affected by that because it's with the LLC, not, not you. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what I would do. Pretty simple, straightforward. I concur. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Hey, okay. are we going to keep going? We're over time right now. Just to let you know what, don't know how let's long. just bang these to... last three out and, and call it good okay okay we we spent so much time talking about mfas MFA. <laughs> that mfa one <laughs> well sorry for the next three then we're gonna we're gonna do the the turbo version of uh, our answers there. <laughs> okay maria wants to know about mentoring or coaching essentially um you know can you do it if you don't if you aren't professional <laughs> Is that a, you know, given two facts, one, someone is really good at giving feedback to others to improve their art and is very good in doing drawers too, but this person has no success in the art area themselves, has no degree or any art school or whatsoever. Is it okay for that person to offer paid coaching or mentorings? I would say, um, be, if you can, if you got the chops to teach people and help people, um, then you absolutely should be offering that as a service because people are dying for it. People want mm-hmm. that so bad. And if you're able to do that, put it out there, just show some before and after examples. Like here's what this student came with to me with, here's how I helped them. Right. Mm-hmm. And that, that is really good. At that point, having a degree or having some professional um, experience, uh, you know, uh, credits to your name is just marketing really, because <laughs> there's people who are professionals that absolutely stink at teaching. They don't know how to fix stuff. And then there's people who are great at teaching 
who, for whatever reason, have haven't had professional experience or uh, uh, success, right? Mm -hmm. um, so don't conflate the two. Sometimes they go together. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but I would look at it that way. I would I would I would come at it from that angle of um, if that's something you're really good at and you want to do, um, start doing it, and then use those build on those. Um, successes that you've had like look at how well i fixed this person thing make a video about it make a landing page and go from there you guys have anything to add to that you, you, as long as you can specifically tell people how to fix their work and not not use words like you know you need to draw better yeah you or need to, you need this, to, you this need drawing needs color. more heart yeah you need more color it, you know that i'm mean, telling you like when when you We've had when when I was a student, I had teachers like that. Like you need, this needs to be better. Like I know that. That's why I'm here. And and we had the, we had like a mutiny in one class because everybody's like, this teacher sucks. They she can't uh, tell us specifically what we need to change. You'll get sniffed out. So, but if you can, you don't need uh, credentials. Yeah. I mean, you don't. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Melissa wants to know how do you find clients that are right for, the, for your skill level. Um, so what do you guys, what do you guys think for that one? Do you mean like, so your if your skill level is, I'm, I'm assuming her skill level is maybe the lower on the lower half. We could look so. at, look at her website, artmelc.com. But she says, I recognize that getting good at illustration is a very long journey. I often feel like the advice often skews towards keep learning and improving until you're at the top of your game. Then you can find work. You can actually find work before you're at the top of your game. Yeah. Honestly. Like the the job that Lee turned down, that that mu mural. Um, you know, I bet if you were just starting out and and it was either that mural job or McDonald's for forty hours that week, I'd rather do the mural job and have a portfolio piece and and go find a client that actually has a budget and uh and get work from that um uh so you, so i think what you do is is have a portfolio put it out there um make connections with art directors make cr connections with with uh, different clients just say hey i'm available and the ones who want to work with you are the ones that are the client for the level of work that you're at essentially um mm -hmm. it, it doesn't go backwards it doesn't you, you have to make something. You have to give yourself an assignment, make a thing, do a thing to prove you, you don't get, you don't get hired to do anything you haven't already done. Right. right. So you got to start making some things, start kind of doing, doing some things. And then those, those clients will at least have a baseline for what your, your ability is, what you're able to do. Um, K Tano, K K Tano. That's a cool mm -hmm. name. This is the last one. I'm looking to up my online sales by utilizing a newsletter. I've got about 300 signed up. That's really good. That's a good start. But I haven't launched it yet. Uh, I had this idea to name my newsletter and kind of brand it as a secret society. I think that's cool too. Kind of like join the secret society. You get secret newsletters not everybody else gets. Um, my advice for your newsletter is make it very clear that people know what they're signing up for. Um, so there's nothing wrong with having a newsletter that's just spam that's just hey every week it's like here's what's for sale in my shop you know uh low stock go get it and i have a, a couple of newsletters that's what i follow because i knew that's what i knew signing up for them i wasn't getting um I, you know i wasn't going to get thoughtful articles i was like oh i want to know when these guys have sales you know that that's why i'm getting these newsletters then there's other newsletters where it's it's um sold to me as get a weekly jolt of inspiration or get a weekly um, uh, breakdown of this particular, you know, there's one that's just about spaceships, right? <laughs> like every week I'm going to um, take a, a iconic spaceship from pop culture and tell you who, you know, the, how it was created and where it was used and, and, and whatnot. Um, so if I'm signing up for that and all of a sudden, you know, every, every other email is, Oh, buy my, you know, my spaceship mug, we're selling spaceship mugs and I'm not mm -hmm. getting content about the spaceships. That gets a little annoying. I'm fine with it 
being thrown in there. Um, but essentially the biggest, the, the most success you'll have is if, if you deliver what you advertise. Mm-hmm. Um, anything, any additional notes or thoughts there? I just, I, I need to send my newsletter now that that reminds me. So. <laughs> I've never done one, so I'm kind of, kind of out of my element on that one, but I like your comment about making sure that you're delivering what that people know what they're signing up for. Yeah. That's something that I see people doing wrong. Um, sometimes, uh, and I would say, especially on YouTube where you think you, you've subscribed to one thing and then you find out, Oh, that's right. not Or they change. I would peg you as the, the, the kind of guy that would be way into doing a newsletter world because you ran a mm. blog for so long. Yeah. Um, it's essentially, and you're so opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> I put that out on YouTube. No, and, my time's going to YouTube. Yeah, and you're a guy who's all about ownership, and mm-hmm. not, not, um, you know, not letting someone else own your audience, but you own your audience. And the newsletter is the only way you can actually um, have uh, unrestricted access to to your audience because mm-hmm. uh, you go in all, all in on any of these social media. Now there's an algorithm that's in between you and, and your audience. You're going to post something and it won't even show up in their account, uh, you know, in their feed or anything. Right. Mm-hmm. A newsletter at, goes to their mailbox every time you send it out and they yeah. have to decide whether or not they're going to open it or close it, but they still see that you posted something, you know, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's funny because when I was into blogging, it was such a, it was a new thing and it was like, you can just publish something, you know, you can hit publish and, but, but there wasn't, the internet was, was a lot newer Mm -hmm. and, uh, our attention wasn't grabbed in a million directions. Now I feel like yeah, it's so much harder to get people's attention because they're, it's just so noisy out there. You know, yeah. you have to have a TikTok, um, a Twitter account, <laughs> oh a gosh. Tumblr, a Hive. Why a don't Mastodon. I like TikTok? Yeah, we need I, we need to start doing K-pop dances as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, TikTok is five things you need to know to <laughs> five <laughs> five things dancing for those of you guys five things you dance. should do before you join your MFA program. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that, that'd be pretty successful uh, TikTok, I, I feel like. A million views right there. Let's wrap it up. We, okay. We Those really, were good questions. Yeah, really good. We did a, a podcast episode. We did it. This is the most podcastiest episode. I of think it's time. awesome that, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like we're tooting our own horn, but we care about the fact that like even these episodes aren't going to be heard by everyone mm-hmm. and we still, you know, really care. Bring, a lot. We bring the, we, yeah. we, we didn't phone this one in. Yeah. We ain't no sissies. <laughs> <laughs> Showed up. All right, did our here work. we go. Everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three point perspective is made possible by SVS learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. It's also made possible by you, the uh, patrons. And we thank you so much for that. We're 100, 100 patrons strong, 100 rabbits strong right now. Nice. We've got rubies, we've got reds, we've got uh, scarlets, we've got the whole <laughs> thing. All right. Hosts today have been, you know us, Will Terry, Lee White, Jake Parker. You can find Will Terry at Will Terry Art on Instagram, Lee White, Lee White Illo on Instagram, and uh, Jake Parker at Jake Parker on Instagram. Uh, podcast produced by Daniel Two. Daniel2.co. He's also running our um, Patreon account as well. So, um, you know, when things get posted on there and questions gets answered, that's that's Daniel. So thank you for that. Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtlift, Show Notes Wrangler, Lily Howell, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott. Now go draw something. <laughs>